Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Jurian Brekelmans will defend the academic thesis New Developments in the Treatment of Corneal Ectatic Disorders. May I invite you to present uh, your study and conclusions of your thesis. Thank you, Pro-Rector. Geachte leden van de oppositie, familie, vrienden, hartelijk dank voor uw aanwezigheid hier vandaag. Ruim 1 op de 400 Nederlanders heeft in meer of mindere mate te maken met een vervorming van het hoofdvlies, eh, waardoor visusverlies kan ontstaan. In de komende 10 tot 15 minuten wil ik graag met u ingaan op de achtergrond hiervan, eh, de behandeling ervan en welk onderzoek wij hierna gedaan hebben. U ziet hier een doorsnede van het oog. Licht komt binnen via het hoofdvlies, passeert de lens om op het netvlies geprojecteerd te worden. Om een scherp beeld te krijgen, moet het binnenkomend licht gebroken worden, zodat het brandpunt op het netvlies valt. Waar veel mensen mogelijk zullen denken dat het grootste deel van de lichtbreking gedaan wordt door de lens, is het in werkelijkheid het hoornvlies dat drie kwart van de breking voor zijn rekening neemt. Afwijkingen in het hoornvlies kunnen dus voor een groot verlies van zicht zorgen. Als we in meer detail naar het hoornvlies kijken, dan kan deze onderverdeeld worden in vijf lagen, waarvan ik er graag drie kort wil toelichten. De buitenste laag is het epitheel en deze vormt een beschermlaag en voorkomt dat de stof uit de hoornvlies binnen kunnen dringen en dat er infecties kunnen ontstaan. De binnenkant van het hoornvlies is bekleed met een enkele cellaag dik endotheel. Deze laag heeft een belangrijke functie in het transparant houden van het hoornvlies en goed gedurende het leven niet meer aan. Eventuele schade hieraan is dus permanent. Tussen het epitheel en het endotheel in zit het stroma dat veruit het grootste deel van het hoornvlies vormt. Het stroma zorgt ervoor dat het hoornvlies haar vorm behoudt en bestaat uit zo'n 200 vrij geordende lagen van collageenbundels. Het is deze strakke ordening van collageenbundels dat ervoor zorgt dat het hoornvlies transparant is. Om de behandeling waar ik het dadelijk over ga hebben goed te kunnen bespreken, moeten we nog iets verder inzoomen op de microstructuur van het hoornvlies. Het stroma bestaat dus uit een strak geordend netwerk van collageenbundels. Als het netwerk van collageenbundels goed werkt, kan het hoornvlies zijn vorm behouden, terwijl het toch elastisch is en krachten van buiten kan weerstaan. Sommige mensen, patiënten, krijgen echter te maken met een disbalans in dit geheel. Het gevolg hiervan kan zijn dat het hoornvlies verdunt en gaat vervormen. Dit proces kan zijn als complicatie van refractiechirurgie, het zogenaamde ooglezeren, maar is veel vaker ten gevolge van een ziekte. De meest voorkomende ziekte is keratoconus, hier in de rechterafbeelding geïllustreerd. Keratoconus is genoemd naar de kegelvormige vorming die kan ontstaan. Keratoconus is een aandoening die aan beide ogen voorkomt, maar vaak begint aan één oog. Het ontstaat vaak al op jonge leeftijd, meestal in de tienerjaren, waardoor het dus een grote en vooral langdurige impact heeft voor patiënten. Een bekende risicofactor voor het ontstaan van keratoconus is allergie waarbij met name het vrij wat het hier vaker bij optreedt, wordt gezien als oorzaak van het ontregelen van het hoornvlies. Onbehandeld kan de, blijft de vervorming toenemen, veelal tot een leeftijd van 30 tot 40 jaar, waarna het vanzelf stabiliseert. Recent onderzoek uit de Universiteit Utrecht heeft laten zien dat ruim 1 op de 400 personen in Nederland in meer of mindere mate een vorm van keratoconus heeft. De gevolgen van keratoconus op het zicht zijn wisselend en zijn met name afhankelijk van de ernst van de vervorming. De afbeelding hier links illustreert veranderingen in het zicht, waarbij de toegenomen lichtschittering, de beeldvervorming en het wazige gezicht op de voorgrond staan. In de behandeling van keratoconus is het vaststellen van de stabiliteit de allereerste stap. Is de vervorming stabiel, dan kunnen speciale contactlensen vaak helpen om het zicht beter te maken. Hier rechtsboven afgebeeld. Een wat minder vaak toegepaste behandeling is het operatief plaatsen van kleine ringen in het hoornvlies om de vervorming deels terug te draaien. Hier links onder weer gegeven. Is de keratoconus dusdanig gevorderd of als er ook al littekenweefsel is ontstaan, dan bestaat er de mogelijkheid van een hoornvliestransplantatie. Het mag voor zich spreken dat dit een zeer ingrijpende operatie betreft. Is de vervorming echter niet stabiel, dan helpt van al deze oplossingen alleen de ingrijpende hoornvliestransplantatie. Dit was de situatie tot ongeveer 2003, waarin een belangrijk onderzoek is gepubliceerd door collega's uit Dresden. In het onderzoek stelden zij een tot dan toe nieuwe behandeling voor, die het grote gat tussen niks kunnen doen en een hoornvliestransplantatie wist te dichten. Zij lieten zien dat door het hoornvlies zogenaamd te crosslinken het verstevigd kon worden. Dat heeft uiteindelijk geleid tot een nieuwe behandeling die de achteruitgang bij keratoconus in de meeste gevallen kan stoppen. 
kostelinken van het hoornvlies is hetgeen waar dit hele proefstuk over gaat en heeft alles te maken met het eerder genoemde stroma van het hoornvlies. De meest gangbare kostlinkenprocedure bestaat uit het verwijderen van het epiteel, het eh, vervolgens aanbrengen van riboflavine, een vloeistof die 30 minuten aangebracht wordt, zodat deze het hoornvlies in kan trekken. En daarnaast het gelukt is het hoornvlies beschijnen met een ultraviolet bundel gedurende 30 minuten. Het gevolg hiervan is dat er een fotochemische reactie optreedt en er nieuwe verbindingen worden eh, gevormd tussen de collageenbundels in het hoornvlies. En dat dit sterker wordt daardoor. Inmiddels is er een ruime 15 jaar ervaring met deze behandeling in de kliniek en zijn er meerdere klinische lange termijn studies gedaan voor het effect van kostdenking. Zo ook wij hebben in Maastricht een lange termijn studie gedaan, retrospectief, samen met collega Asli Eifels. De dossiers van ruim 200 patiënten zijn bekeken over een periode van vijf jaar en daarbij hebben wij gevonden dat de kostdenkingbehandeling zowel de vervorming van het hoornvlies als het zicht kan verbeteren. Daarbij vonden we ook dat hoe slechter de situatie voor de behandeling was, des te groter was het effect van de behandeling. Alhoewel dat zeer fraaie resultaten zijn, bleek uit onze studie ook dat toch nog steeds 9,3% van de patiënten dat daarbij de behandeling uiteindelijk niet succesvol was. En dat er na een periode van één jaar toch achteruitgang werd gezien. Dit is niet het enige nadeel van de behandeling. Zo betreft het een relatief lange procedure van ruim een uur, terwijl juist de personeelskosten de grootste kostenpost zijn. En dus zou verkorting hiervan voor, zowel voor de patiënt comfort kunnen bieden als een financieel voordeel kunnen opleveren. Tevens is het verwijderen van het epiteel een pijnlijke ingreep met bovendien risico op infectie en vorming van dit tekenweefsel. Een ander heel belangrijk risico is het, uh, de potentiële schade die het aan het endoteel aan kan richten. Als de reactie alleen op het niveau van het uh, alleen op een vlak op plaatsvindt, dan kan het veilig gedaan worden. Maar gebeurt het ook op het niveau van het endoteel, dan kan het onomkeerbare schade aanrichten aan het endoteel. Dit heeft er dan ook toe geleid dat het eigenlijk lange tijd minimaal 400 micrometer dikte moest zijn om de behandeling veilig te kunnen uitvoeren. Dit blijkt echter problematisch gezien de progressieve aard van de keratoconus waarbij toenemende verdunning op kan treden, waardoor veel patiënten buiten de boot vielen. In hoofdstuk 3 van dit proefschrift hebben we gekeken naar de veiligheid van de behandeling. Als we de ribofavine niet 30 minuten, maar slechts 10 minuten aanbrengen. Zoals gezegd hangt de veiligheid van crosslinking af van de reactie die bij het endoteel plaats kan vinden. Om deze reactie plaats te laten vinden, heb je zowel UVA-licht nodig als ribofavine. De hoeveelheid van beide is echter afhankelijk van hoe lang je de ribofavine aanbrengt op het, uh, uh, op het hoornvlies. In het lab hebben we bepaald hoeveel ribofavine en UVA-licht bij het endoteel aanwezig is in beide protocollen. Hieruit bleek dat na 10 minuten er weliswaar anderhalf keer meer uva licht bij het endoteel komt, maar er tevens zo'n 3,5 keer minder ribofavina aanwezig is. Theoretisch zou dit dus een minder schadelijk effect moeten opleveren. Dit hebben we vervolgens eh, onderzocht door endoteel op te groeien in het lab en daaruit blijkt dat inderdaad beide protocollen veilig kunnen toegepast worden. De behandeling kan dus veilig verkort worden hiermee. Dit betreft dus een aanpassing van het huidige protocol om de nadelige effecten van ribofavina te omzeilen. In de afgelopen 15 jaar is er echter ook uitgebreid onderzoek gedaan naar alternatieve vloeistoffen die ook crosslinking kunnen bewerkstelligen. Meerdere stoffen, ieder met hun eigen respectieve golflengte en daarbij behorende voor- en nadelen, hebben hierbij de revue gepasseerd. Een aantal daarvan zijn hier weergegeven en één daarvan, de WSD11, wil ik graag uh, nader toelichten omdat deze een belangrijke rol speelt in het proefschrift. WSD11 is ontwikkeld in het Weizmann Institute of Science en is een pigment voorkomend in sommige bacteriën. Initieel was het onderzoek naar WSD11 gericht naar de behandeling van verschillende kankers, waaronder prostaatkanker. En WSD11 kan geactiveerd worden door nabij infrarood licht met een golflengte van 755 nanometer. Het voordeel van deze golflengte is dat het diep doordringt in weefsel eh, en dat het in tegenstelling tot het ultraviolet aanlicht op zichzelf staan niet schadelijk is. Dit maakt het dus potentieel een goed alternatief voor het crosslinken van dunne hoornvliezen, waarbij ribofavina en UVA mogelijk schadelijk is. In de hoofdstukken 4 tot en met 7 van mijn proefschrift komt zowel ribofavine en WSD11 aan bod. De procedure bij WSD11 crosslinking is vergelijkbaar met die van ribofavine. Allereerst wordt het epiteel verwijderd, waarna de WSD11 voor 20 minuten aangebracht wordt en het gedurende 30 minuten beschenen wordt met nabij infrarood licht. Ook voor WSD11 geldt dus dat het epiteel verwijderd dient te worden. In een, probleem dat, in een poging het probleem te tackelen 
hebben we in hoofdstuk 4 een nieuwe methode voorgesteld om het epiteel slechts gedeeltelijk met een laser te verwijderen. Enerzijds wil je tijdens het kostelinken natuurlijk voldoende epiteel verwijderen om voldoende vloeistof in het stroom maar door te laten trekken. Anderzijds wil je zo min mogelijk epiteel verwijderen om het herstel te bevorderen. Vanuit die gedachte hebben we geopperd om met een laser heel selectief epiteel te verwijderen, zoals hier rechts geïllustreerd is. Eigenlijk als het ware alsof de kanalen in het epiteel ge gemaakt worden. Hierbij zagen we dat het vloeistof er mooi in het hoofdjes doordringen en dat er ook een verstevend effect kan ontstaan, maar toch laat het onderzoek duidelijke beperkingen zien. Het allerbelangrijkste hierbij is wel dat de huidige apparatuur eigenlijk niet nauwkeurig genoeg is om alleen het epiteel te raken en dat dus ook het stroom aangedaan wordt. Daarbij is de gebruikte laser uh, erg prijzig en zal de methode dus niet breed toepasbaar zijn. Al met al laat het een proof of concept zien, maar nog geen toepasbare behandeling. In hoofdstukken 5 en 6 hebben we gekeken naar de effectiviteit van crosslinken van WSD11. Allereerst hebben we gekeken naar het effect als we de belichtingsduur verkorten. En daarna hebben we gekeken naar de lange termijn effecten van de behandeling. Om te bepalen welke belichtingsduur voldoende verstevering geeft, hebben we konijnenogen behandeld waarbij we de verlichting van 30 naar 5 en 1 minuut hebben teruggebracht. Vervolgens hebben we met trektesten gekeken of de verstevering is opgetreden. Hieruit bleek dat de belichtingsduur ook bij slechts 5 minuten nog steeds een effectieve behandeling kan geven. Vervolgens is het natuurlijk belangrijk om te weten dat deze verstevering blijvend is. Om dat te bepalen hebben we konijnen behandeld en na 1, 4 of 8 maanden wederom met trektesten bepaald of verstevering blijvend was. Hieruit bleek dat de behandeling ook na 8 maanden nog steeds aanwezig is. Naast het verstevigend effect is het van Koslinken bekend dat het een vertragend effect kan bieden op enzymatische vertering. Dit kan relevant zijn in de behandeling van keratoconus, maar meer nog in de behandeling van hoornvliesinfecties, wat het de laatste jaren ook in meerdere mate toegenomen wordt toegepast. In hoofdstuk 7 kijken we naar het effect van ribavirine en wst 11 koslinking op deze enzymatische vertering. Hiervoor hebben we varkensogen behandeld met zowel ribavirine als wst 11 en daarna in een oplossing met het enzym collagenase gelegd, dat erop gericht is om het collageen af te breken. Na zes uur bleken alle onbehandelde hoornvliezen volledig te zijn verteerd, terwijl alle behandelde hoornvliezen nog steeds aanwezig waren. Dit laat dus zien dat de crosslinking de vertering door enzymen kan vertragen. Samenvattend blijkt uit het proefschrift dat ribavirina en uva crosslinking in ruim 90% van de patiënten stabilisatie biedt, en daarnaast hebben we laten zien dat het aanbrengen van ribavirine veilig verkort kan worden tot 10 minuten en het slechts gedeeltelijk verwijderen van het epiteel waarschijnlijk effectief kan zijn, maar helaas praktisch nog niet toepasbaar is op dit moment. Wat betreft wst 11 crosslinking eh, hebben we laten zien dat de belichtingsduur van 30 naar 5 minuten teruggebracht kan worden en dat het eh, verstevende effect langdurig is. En als laatste bieden zowel ribavirine als de wst 11 een beschermend effect tegen het enzymatische verteren van toonvlies. Collega-onderzoekers zijn inmiddels in verschillende samenwerkingen verder gegaan met het onderzoek naar WC11 neer eh, voor andere oogkundige toepassingen. Een belangrijke onderzoeksvraag hierbij is of het crosslinken van het oogwit en vertraging van het, eh, de achteruitgang bij benzintijd kan tegengaan, zoals hier rechts is afgebeeld. En verder eh, wordt er onderzocht of de WC11 kan helpen in de behandeling van hoornvliesinfecties of tumoren van het oog. Maar wie weet daarover een paar jaar meer op dezezelfde plek. Dan dank ik u daarmee voor uw aandacht en geef ik graag het woord terug aan de pro-rector. Hartelijk dank voor deze heldere uitleg in het Nederlands. Dat maakt het toegankelijk voor iedereen in de zaal. However, in view of the presence of some uh, members of your evaluation committee from abroad, I suggest that we continue the defense uh, in English. And the opposition will be opened by Professor Hacking, who is professor of biochemistry. Uh, and was also the chair of the assessment committee, Professor Heck. Thank you, Mr. Prorector, dear candidate. First, I would like to congratulate and compliment you on this, this wonderful thesis. You've performed in-depth research on the cross-linking of the connective tissue in the stroma of the cornea to halt the horrible and disabling disease uh, keratoconus. You did very well. There are many beautiful papers. I congratulate you on that. And of course, the congratulations also apply to your uh, promotion team. Um, After I read your thesis, I realized how precious our eyes actually are, and we always take them for granted. So thank you for bringing that back to me, and I really cherish my eyes. And at least after reading your thesis, do not rub them as often as I used to do, because I think this is also increasing the chance of uh, keratoconus. 
I was actually hit by your figure on, uh, on page uh, 16, uh, your figure uh, 3A and especially B, because I work in the Cardiovascular Research Institute and I directly saw the similarities uh, between uh, your uh, cornea and uh, keratoconus and, uh, so to say, our uh, abdominal and thoracic uh, aneurysms. And I was therefore also really excited uh, to see on the next page that you also uh, have linked this to the multiple co co comorbidities, such as Ehlers-Danlos and Marfan syndrome, which are all like inherited disorders of, of, of connective tissues. Uh, and I wondered, you showed in your uh, introductory uh, slide that the incidence of, uh, of keratoconus is three uh, in a thousand. And I also know that the aneurysms are about five in thousands. And the aneurysms, you can never predict. There's always chance discoveries when people have a CT. So I wonder, is this the answer to like these huge problems uh, for our uh, vascular surgeons, that we, all the people with keratoconus send them to the vascular surgeons and see if they have an abdominal or thoracic aneurysm. What's your idea about that? Hi, this is esteemed opponent. Thank you very much. Um, in regards to the uh, coincidence of uh, aneurysmas and keratoconus, I don't think there's any connection there. Um, first of all, uh, the, of course, I'm not completely uh, aware of abdominal structures uh, anymore, but the, the cornea itself is, is, is a specific type of organ, but mainly collagen type 1 uh, in there. Um, also, the, like I said, the, the incidence is, the progression starts mainly around teenage years. So I think aneurysmas of the abdominal uh, are the mainly in, in the older age. Um, so I don't think there's a connection there. I, I mentioned the, uh, the comorbidities there because mm -hmm. we do know uh, they exist. Um, mainly Down syndrome is so very well known. The others are, are more or less incidental, I think. It, it, it has been described, but um, I haven't had met a single keratoconus patient that had, for, for example, Elodanus or something. Yeah, exactly, but if you see that, that if, you, if you start your life with, with, with impaired connective tissue, like in collagen or, or fibrillin, through uh, Marfan or Elodanus, you would develop uh, keratoconus maybe at a younger age, but then maybe like in your Orta on, on a later age. So, is is there anything known about the connection, or we don't know? Um, well, well we, uh, as far as I'm aware, I'm not aware of any uh, straight connection there. Good. So, it, it speaks to mind that there, are, like you said, if there's a connective tissue disease, then the one thing might lead to the another one. Yeah. Um, but I'm not aware if there are any uh, uh, clinical studies done on patients uh, that have keratoconus and also the incidence of. Okay. Aneurysms, for example. Well, I think we, we have to uh, look into this with your promotion team. I'll make an appointment. I think we already have some interesting stuff to discuss, like in the pre-discussions we had before. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, your, your chemical or photochemical cross-linking uh, is mainly, uh, at least with the uh, riboflavin, is, is using a UVA. And you also said it, or they said in your introduction, also in your, in your um, um, thesis that it's really toxic, especially for the endothelial cells. Do you actually know how the chemical reaction works? Uh, there's a the formation mainly of singlet oxygen there. Right, and what does it do? Uh, it's a reactive oxygen species, so it causes uh, a damage to, to any viral cell. No, no, I mean the cross-linking reaction. Ah, to so the cross-linking reaction itself. Um, th th there are some clues on what it does, uh, although a little bit circumstantial. Okay. Um, the, the uh, collagen fibril I showed is a, it's a, a packed bundle of collagen subfibrils. Right. Um, and there's, um, there are suggestions that there are either connections in between the collagen uh, fibrils itself, right. so within the, uh, but on the surface within the collagen fibril, or in the surrounding proteoglycans. Right. Uh, not so much directly between um, the collagen fibrils itself, but I mainly mean within or within the surrounding particle like Well, I, saw, I had to look it up myself because I didn't know it by, by, by heart, but it's actually pretty specific. It changes the imidazole of the histidine side chain in your collagen to an imidazolone, and that can react with a nucleophile, such as there are in hydroxyproline, which is plenty present in, mm -hmm. in the collagens, and then making a cross-link, and also with histidine or, or threonine. So it's, I think it's pretty well known yeah. what, it, what it does, your, your theory. Uh, yeah, so we, we don't do know what it does. Um, there are studies on uh, X-ray diffraction. Right. Um, uh, actually, there's also, we, uh, it's not in the thesis here, but we did a, a collaboration between the uh, group in Cardiff with yeah. X-ray diffraction, uh, looking at the diameter of the uh, collagen fibrils right. and the surrounding proteoglycans. And um, also for riboflavin, they, they show before and now with the WC11, there are 
is not any structural change. So the, the collagen fibril doesn't change in diameter. There's no change in deeper radicity. Um, but what they do notice is that uh, um, if you uh, transfer samples to the X-ray microscope and you have to, to dehydrate them, of course, the shrinkage is uh, much uh, is different between riboflavin and WC11. So okay. there yes, are different crosslinks. Most likely, yes. Yeah. Okay. So on which level, uh, we don't know yet. Okay. Can I go on a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, short one. So um, in, in in your chapter uh, seven, uh, you discuss like one of the advantages of your your chemical crosslinking is is that your 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 fibrils, your collagen fibrils, are less susceptible to to cleavage by uh, uh, collagenases, for example, um, metalloproteases one, which is the, the most famous collagenase. And it's okay, this is sort of like an advantage if you if you do this stuff. So, um, but then your uh, your your sites in your stroma, they're they're known like for their abundant synthesis of of metalloproteases, especially MMP one, which is the, one of the main collagenases. So instead of to getting this risky uh, uh, UVA cross-linking that could damage your endothelial cells, which, by the way, also make collagen one, so that's also an important source, why don't you apply, or have you thought about applying just uh, uh, metalloprotease inhibitors like in eye drops and, and try to do that? Like then you sort of shortcut the effect that you establish with stabilizing your uh, collagen fibrils. Um. We haven't done this, so this is no. not our research, but, but of course it's a, it's a completely logical uh, idea. The, the thesis mainly uh, built around the WC11 or the, the cross link for, for its sample. And along the way we, well, we, we find out it may have a, a result in the enzymatic digestion or the, at least a, the, the, the decrease of that. Uh, but of course, yeah, maybe the MMP1 or 14, for example, uh, inhibitors might also work in that regard. Yeah, it, it, it's only uh, one of the uh, the thoughts that uh, the crosslinking may help in infectious keratitis. Uh, also, the the, the bounds, extra bounds, may cause steric hindrance, so the penetration slows, uh, and also the, the the cornea weakens due to thinning. So, yeah. uh, next to that, it's the side effect of the crosslinking is the, the yeah. increased stiffness. Yeah, that would help. be my next question, but I, I I'm very happy with your answer, and I give the word back to the corrector. Thank you, Professor Hacking. Um, now the opposition will be continued by Professor Schertz, um, Professor of Biochemistry, typically in the context of cancer therapy, at the Weizmann Institute of Science, uh, Reovot in Israel. And we're always happy that we have international guests uh, in our opposition. Professor Schertz, the floor is yours. And please switch on your microphone. Yeah, well, congratulate you, Julian, first of all. It was a pleasure to have you in our lab, and I'll talk about it a little later. Um, I will not be specific on the uh, different chapters. I think we know it quite well. But I would like to ask you what kind of, I would say, revolutionary idea you had uh, um, toward the uh, method of treatment with both riboflavin and WST11 that may change the uh, clinical practice based on what you saw in the basic research, because we are all dealing with translation, and I think this is quite uh, important for new students to understand that what they are doing in the basic research can really apply to the real world uh, under some conditions. So if you could please try to illuminate that point, yeah. uh, and how did you feel about it? Uh, Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much, first of all, for being here. Um, yeah, so the, the uh, revolutionary thought about uh, collagen crossing of the cornea is basically in the, in the safety parameter that's, uh, that is increased by WC11. So we do know that riboflavin penetrates fully, like I showed in the, in the slides, uh, which may cause damage to the endothelium because you will get a reaction there as well. From the WC11, we know that we can limit the penetration depth uh, uh, rather easily, actually, by just adding dextrin to it, we can basically get a linear response on how deep it goes. Um, in one of the chapters, um, uh, with chapter four, with the fluorescent microscope, we clearly see a, a front of, of WC11 and then clear corneal stroma. So um, I think the revolutionary thought is that uh, you will be able to not completely target the cross-linking, but uh, treat really thin corneas as well. The limit of 400 micrometers that has been set for a long time is, is, 
it's actually a high, uh, it's a high limit. So many patients will be progressed below. Um, it's a theoretical approach because we know also from the literature that if you cross-link thinner corneas, it is not always effective. So let's say I have a cornea of 250 microns. Theoretically, you would have a safe approach with the WST11 as you can limit the, the cross-linking response only to the anterior part. We do know that the anterior part is the, the, the most effective place to have cross-links, it's the, the most stiff part. Um, but we do not know if, if, if you would treat the cornea with 250 microns, if it would really uh, present a long-term stiffening effect as well. But I think that's the, where the, that's the part where the revolutionary uh, part of the WS11 in, in collagen crossing of the cornea would, would exist. I, I'm also referring to the riboflavin um, because you show that you did some modification of the time of impregnation and the time of illumination. What does it mean to the patient and to the practice of the practical clinic? Yeah, that's really straightforward. I think um, the, the progress itself is like 30 minutes of impregnation, 30 minutes of irradiation. That's the, the, the default protocol. There have been many protocols by now also uh, limiting the time. But reducing the time from 30 to 10 minutes, it, it's, a, it's a major difference. Um, there was a study, uh, I think in 2015 or 16 in the Netherlands, where they showed that 88% of the uh, cost are of riboflavin cross-linking in, here in the touch area center are due to the time, the, to the cost of the personnel. So um, I don't know the number by heart, but it's reducing it from 30 to 10 minutes. Well, first of all, it saves money and a lot of comfort for the patient, I think. That's, thank you very much. I finished. Okay, thank you for your opposition. Uh, the opposition will now be uh, continued by Professor Bendig. Uh, he's a, a professor of uh, corneal uh, diseases and ophthalmology uh, at Umia University in Sweden. Also you, very th thankful that you are here and to participate in this opposition. And the floor is yours. Thank you also so you, please switch on the microphone. Yeah, uh, I don't have a microphone, but I borrow, borrow this one, <laughs> I hope. I have a very strong voice. People complain about that, and I, I think this, this time it is probably. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here, and it's been a, a real pleasure reading your thesis. I, it's it's very, very nice. Um, first of all, I have a sort of a clinical question. Um, I know that you work as an ophthalmologist, um, and... Um, you mentioned here that iron deposits in the basal cell layer of the, the uh, corneal epithelium is uh, a feature of keratoconus. Is that a, sort of a unique feature for keratoconus, or can it be seen in other conditions as well? Highly esteemed opponent, also thank you very much for taking the time to come here. Um, no, it's not a unique version. Uh, it's not, not, not a unique uh, thing to keratoconus. It can be seen, however, that there's like an iron deposit area. Can you mention any other conditions where it can be seen? Uh, 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 loads of, of surface uh, diseases basically can, can cause this to happen. Um, chronic dry eyes, for example. Yeah. Very nice. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering about chapter three. Um, uh, you used um, immortalized human corneal endothelial cells um, uh, for that um, uh, experiment. And I noticed that you, you grow them in um, a medium enriched with fetal calf serum. Uh, and you also had this fetal calf serum when you did the actual treatment, uh, or, as I understand it? Um, so we grew them in, in uh, like a serum of fetal calf serum mm -hmm. um, to produce a monolayer. And then before treatment, we replaced uh, uh, the liquid with riboflavin. So it was only riboflavin and uh, saline, or, uh, or was no, it no, no saline, because that, that's uh, detrimental to the cells. Yeah. Um, you have me doubt now. <laughs> uh, I'm not 100% sure. We, we did switch the, the liquid for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I think you're right, and of course you read it. Uh, there may have been fetal cough serum there, yeah. Um, the reason why I wonder is that, that these uh, culture mediums usually contain a lot, a lot of... Uh, uh, amino acids and, and uh, other stuff that, that uh, uh, might affect the cells uh, uh, in, in various way, ways and also affect the, the chemical reactions that, that uh, the UV light will induce and so on. Um, just connecting to, to what was mentioned earlier here, 
about the clinical relevance. What do you think of the clinical relevance of, of cultured cells like this, and, and can that be directly translated into to human conditions? So the, uh, the immortalized cell line is for sure you cannot uh, translate it to uh, in vivo settings. We know that for sure. Uh, the, to refer again to the 400 micrometers, it has been based on, uh, on porcine cells, for example. Mm -hmm. So from clinic now, like 10, 15 years later, we know that even if you go below the 400 micrometers, it's not, not a hard limit. Even below, it can be done safely. So there's a discrepancy between what you find in vivo and in vitro. Um, I think what was unique to what we did was that it was a, a human cell line, immortalized cell line. So it's also mentioned as a limitation in the study. You can translate it directly to what's happening in a patient, but we use it as a comparison between two protocols. And I think that's, that's a fair comparison there. Yeah. Also, if I may back, get back to the, uh, the effect of uh, amino acids in, in, the, in the liquid, we try to limit it as much as possible by irradiating it from below. So any liquid from above, should have interfered to a minimum to, to what happened at the endothelial cell layer. Yes, of course, but, but the amino acids and whatever is in the medium will go into the cells yeah. as well, of course, and, yeah. and have effects, yeah. So, so, yeah, very good. But it's good, uh, good to re always remember this, that what you do in the lab and what you do in the patient is not always the same thing. So, so it's very good. Um, um, I was wondering in chapter six about, um, you mentioned keratocyte apoptosis here, and, uh, but you had no control group with only epithelial debridement, but no cross-linking. Um, why do you think I asked that question? <laughs> no, um, what happens when you, you remove the corneal epithelium and do nothing, nothing else? What happens to the keratocyte? You also influence uh, the stroma, so you also get some apoptosis there. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I do agree. It may have been the best to have an, a control group there. Um, although I strongly feel you should limit the number of, of rabbits you should sacrifice. And it's something very, pretty well known from the literature that it happens. So um, what, what's shown in the, the chapter is that we, uh, I don't want to mention the, the word demarcation line because it's not a demarcation line. But from histology reports, we clearly see a, a, a line almost halfway through the cornea. Mm -hmm. or at a 50% depth. So uh, I do feel, I do know that it's a treatment effect from WC11 because if you were to scrape the epithelium, it does not reach 50% of the, the, the stroma. That's good. So it's, so it, it is more keratocyte apoptosis, uh, uh, really. So it's, a lot, it's, it's yeah. A yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Um, my last question is, is more, more of a general question uh, referring to riboflavin or the taurine, um, um, you have several factors in the cross-linking reaction. You have the substrate, the cornea, of course, the corneal stroma. Um, you have light, you have a photosensitizer, and you have oxygen. Which one of these do you think is generally the, the rate-limiting uh, um, factor uh, for the reaction? Um, by far, um, uh, oxygen. Basically, of course, you do need, do need uh, like a riboflavin or a chromophore and, and light that's you need it, but the limiting factor will be oxygen in this case, I think, yeah, which is also quite known from the literature from riboflavin, not done on WC11, but a um, higher percentage of oxygen by goggles or, or uh, pulsed light, it does show a difference, yeah. Pulsed light, why, why would that make a difference? Uh, there, so there are many, several treatment protocols that does like an on-off, for like a second or a second or a half a second to allow from some oxygen diffusion in between. I'm not 100% sure you will not be able to, to uh, uh, saturate the cornea with oxygen in, the, in the, 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 those mere seconds, um, but there are studies that show that there, the pulse light does increase stiffness compared to um, a full treatment with high fluids, for example. Very good, thank you. I'm satisfied. Thank you, uh, Professor Bending, for your opposition, uh, which will now be continued by Professor Reutlingsberger, Professor of Biochemistry and Apoptosis at this university, and Professor Reutlingsberger was also a member of the Assessment Committee. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Um, dear candidate, uh, I would also like to start with uh, uh, giving you my compliments on this uh, thesis, which I enjoyed uh, very much reading it. 
And it was also for me an, uh, what we call an eye opener. I d <laughs> I'm not so familiar with, with the topic, uh, um, but I enjoyed it very much and I understand fully your reasoning, the background, the, the problems in the field. You made quite a clear picture for me. I would also extend these compliments uh, to your promotion team. Um, well, I had a number of questions uh, pointing at the uh, translation of your findings from uh, basic research to uh, clinical application. And um, my, fo my questions focus on, on the basic research, unfortunately. So I would like to start with uh, chapter three, and it, was, uh, it has been discussed already a little bit about uh, the major concern in, in your clinical practice when you use UV light and, and uh, riboflavin is the damage of the endothelial cells. And the endothelial cells, as you point out, uh, they are formed in, at a stage during development, and then they stay for the rest of your life. They stay at, the, at that site. There is no replication, no uh, proliferation, so they are terminally differentiated. One question I don't understand very much, the anatomy, and how are these cells uh, provided with, uh, with nutrients and, and oxygen? Can you tell me that a little bit? Because sure. I just interpone it. Thank you yeah. very much for the kind words. Um, so uh, um, what's different from the cornea is that it's avascular, of course. So the nutrition is also different, um, which may come from the tear film from the outside or from the inside itself. In the inside. So when I when I put something in in the blood, uh, will it reach these, the uh, the endothelial cells? Uh, not per se. There's a blood blood eye barrier, let's say, to okay, uh, just like similar but to the small brain. molecules. Then uh, will they will they? So so would would uh, a therapy with uh, small molecules by venous uh, intravenous administration be an option in this case? Uh, it, it may reach there. Yeah, I'm not sure how small they have to, would have to be, but okay, uh, it may reach. Okay, um, let's, let's go to the, uh, your major concern is that the therapy destroys endothelial cells and they are not replaced anymore. So you, uh, you try to change the protocol of the uh, UV uh, uh, application um, and then you focused on uh, what does this do to the endothelial cells. As, by the previous opponent, you use the immortalized uh, cell line. But first, what, uh, the, the um, cell death inducing mechanisms that are, in, or the cell death uh, program that are induced with, uh, with the riboflavin and, and the UV line. You mentioned uh, peroxide, but is that, is that all? Have you any idea uh, so what, what kills the cells? So uh, we, we know from riboflavin UVA crossing, it's been in contrast to the WC11, but uh, there are mainly seeing that oxygen uh, radicals formed. Yeah. Uh, also some hydroxyl and superoxide, uh, w which can have a direct effect on the, on the endothelial cell if it happens at the endothelial level. Yeah. yeah. But you are also concerned that uh, when you uh, shorten the incubation or the impregnation time, that too much UV light will reach the endothelial layer. Yeah, so the, the, the combination of UVA light, the, the amount of UVA light, um, and the concentration of riboflavin at any field, it's, it's a magnification that, that allows f to calculate the oh, amount so of So the UV light happening. itself also uh, kills the cells? Uh, no, so UV light uh, without any riboflavin, um, hardly from the literature it said that there's, you have to reach really high fluency, which we don't even come close to. Okay. Uh, okay. So it, it's the combination. It's mainly the combination. Yeah. Ma mainly the combination. We, we did see a trend uh, when you go to higher UVA irradiance that there's a little bit more mortality. Yeah. Um, but it was not significant from the top of my head. And then uh, you used a, a, um, a viability assay to assess the, the cell death inducing properties of, of uh, the UV light and the riboflavin. Yeah. Um, can I ask you something specific about this cell death assay, viability? Have you done them yourselves or? I, I did the viability stain myself with help, of course. It's not, okay. not really my field, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, in, in your thesis, you uh, call it uh, luminescence that you measure. But is it luminescence? Is it absorbance or luminescence? Uh, 
I do think it's luminescence because we, we stand it with WSD1. Yeah, it's, it's a, a bit it's unfortunate name here, but. Uh, it's a tetrazoleum, eh? So the tetrazoleum, and I think it's, it's absorbance. And you measure it at which uh, wavelength? Uh, I do not know that no. by heart. No, sorry. Yeah. I would have to look it up. <laughs> so I looked it up at, okay. the, at the Sigma uh, protocol because you bought it from Sigma. And uh, it's absorbance measurements around 450. You can use 450 nanometers or 470 nanometers. But also in your, uh, in your uh, chapter, you show the absorption spectra of, uh, of riboflavin. And also this compound absorbs at uh, 450 nanometer. So do you think that was the right choice of, of, your, uh, of your viability assay? Um, in that case, it's a difficult so in, in, in question. Case, no, but, uh, torturing you. Yeah, the, the question is how much riboflavin would still be there because uh, we did wash it afterwards. But you should assume there's still riboflavin there. So you should assume there's uh, also absorbance by the riboflavin at this wavelength. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so, but there is a chance of overestimation uh, yeah. of your survival. Yes. Yeah. The, the second question would then be, would it interfere with the different protocols that we use? We would use different riboflavin concentrations, of course, uh -huh. um, uh -huh. which you may assume, yes, but I would not, by the top of my head, know which direction yeah. it would go then. Maybe, maybe a point for reconsideration, uh, because I, I want to go to the translation of your findings, because I think, uh, I, I, if I read correctly, the uh, the conclusion of uh, uh, your conclusion is that it's safe to use the 10 minutes impregnation time, and your main conclusion is based on on the fact that the endothelial cells do not suffer more at 10 minutes impregnation than. Mm -hmm. But then, <clears throat> can you translate these findings to the uh, to the clinical situation? And then I come back to the endothelial cells that were discussed earlier. Um, it's an immortalized cell line. Yes, like I said before, you cannot really translate it directly. So the, 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 what we did in vitro, it's not the same as in vivo, of course. Yeah. The reason to, to undergo this experiment was that there was, uh, it's also in the supplementary material there. There have been so many different protocols applied also in clinic, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, ranging from two minutes of riboflavin application until 30. So there was already a uh, movement going on in clinic to reduce the time from 30, sometimes to 15 or 10 minutes. It's, it's many different protocols. Uh -huh. So this experiment was, we, we do know clinical results that show that there's in clinic no uh, endothelial damage, mm -hmm. not much more than with the 30 minutes. Uh, this was to theoretically and experimentally uh, okay. provide a basis there. So, so uh, do you think uh, you could convince the authorities with these data to, uh, to start a procedure, to start this procedure in the clinics with uh, 10 minutes impregnation? It was already done, so. Uh, it's already done? Yeah, yeah so the. Okay, uh, so I was not aware of that. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the Dresden protocol, uh, the one introduced in 2003, that's the protocol that applies 30 minutes, 30, 30 minutes, minutes. Yes. Uh, but since then, you can name how many uh, different protocols have been applied in clinic based yeah. on on empirical results. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, the the um, combination of um, UV light and riboflavin kills the uh, endothelial cell, but not only the endothelial cells, also the keratocytes. And um, it was already touched upon uh, in, in chapter six, but that was with a different uh, photosensitizer. Mm -hmm. um, in chapter three, you look at the endothelial cells, but not at the keratocytes. And now I wonder, is that a concern in your field, that the application or the, the, the combination kills uh, keratocytes? Uh, there are different opinions about that, I think, because um, one of the theories underlying keratoconus is that there might be, uh, uh, that the keratocytes themselves might be the, the one doing wrong, uh, like uh, in, in the turn of the collagen. So, yeah. um, also if you, uh, like I said, the, the corneal transplantations have been done also for keratoconus, and there are uh, reports that even after transplantation, replacing it by a donor, oh. the keratoconus may um, continue. So, uh, that's food for, for thought, I think, uh, also in regards to the keratocytes. So, 
yes, on one hand, you don't want to kill anything that's, that's supposed to be there, but on the other hand, maybe the killing the keratocytes also is a beneficial um, part of the, the treatment itself. Okay. Um, I look at the pro rector now. I had a lot of time, he said, but, yep. but it's up. I thank you very much okay, for your I'm opposition. Okay, I'm very satisfied with your answers. Thank, thank you very much. I give the word back to the pro rector. Thank you for your opposition, Professor Linsberger. And the opposition will now be continued by Dr. Lapit, who is a corridor surgeon at Amsterdam University Medical Center. And she was also a member of the assessment committee. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Julian, first of all, I want to compliment you on this uh, really beautiful uh, PhD thesis and your instructors as well. Of course, I as a coronary surgeon, I look at the illustration on top and I think, is this the way your keratoconus patients see the world or is this the epithelial mapping I, and, and the UVA? I have no idea. In any case, I would like to uh, take you to several points that you uh, mentioned in your thesis and then in page uh, 69 in your discussion, you're telling about a rabbit uh, um, uh, model and uh, its translation to uh, human disease that we're unsure if we can account for the endothelial toxicity from the laboratory into uh, human life. And then in page 85, you have your porcine um, model, you know, with the figure one showing us all the layers of uh, the cornea, uh, including a Bauman's membrane. You are aware that pigs don't have a Bauman's membrane. Uh, Esteemed opponent, I do believe they have, but much thinner than the, the human. So uh, there are some layers with collagen type four that's supposed to be a basement membrane. Okay, so, and then in your discussion in the, in the same paper, um, you're lasering that, that, that cornea in a pattern way and you state that we do not want to go through the Bauman's membrane that you think is there and I think it's not. And um, why is that? Why is it so important not to go through a membrane? So, uh, esteemed opponent, thanks, yeah. Um, so, uh, the, just to clarify, the, the, the inaccuracy was mainly in measuring the epithelial depth. So, the laser, that was fine. We could clearly arrange it uh, on, on the depth itself. Um, of course, the limitation of the study is it's an ex vivo study. So, we don't know if it's a problem going through the Bauman's layer or into the stroma. But um, we did some spectrometry readings there. It's also uh, shown uh, two different kind of ways. And we did see uh, a clear difference in the, the, the laser-treated samples. So um, we know from, from keratoconus itself that the epithelium will regrow over parts. If you go through the Bauman layer, that may provide difficulties, but we do know that the epithelium can form a, a smooth layer with different uh, uh, thicknesses. So maybe if you would do it in vivo, in the end it would result in, in a clear cornea. But our readings for now, and my gut feeling also says that if you would do it like this, um, you would get some, some aberrations due to the, the laser itself, most likely. Aberrations or frank refractive errors, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so what, what do you think about uh, doing, uh, for example, PRK, taking away some of the aberrations in people with keratoconus while doing the cross-linking? What, what's your idea about that? Uh, that's... A, uh, First of all, let me uh, clarify, I don't have any clinical experience with cross-linking, let alone with PRK. So um, I do know it from the literature. Um, there are some quite, quite good results on doing the PRK with cross-linking. The opinions are, I think, differing in when to do it, in which order, and which time frame there has to be in between. If I would have to do it on my own eyes, I may go for PRK with cross-linking, or I would have at least a year between. So I would do the cross-linking, and maybe after a year or so, I do a PRK. I will not combine them. Okay. Now, um, Professor Tillman was asking you about the metalloproteinases, right? And um, um, you had a discussion about the apoptosis of the keratocytes, and you were saying that keratocytes might be, may be have an influence on the development of keratoconus in some eyes. 
And uh, what, what, what is our working definition of a keratoconus in, in patients? Can you, can you cite that one? Uh, which the definition? definition of a keratoconus. Uh, that's the ne next question on how to, to diagnose it, I think. Uh, the definition that has been used for a long time is uh, mainly the K-max, or the maximal uh, keratometry value. Uh, I, I, no, I really mean it's a non-inflammatory ectatic disease, uh, okay, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the definition that we still have in the books, yes. right? So if, if the metalloproteinases are so... Uh, 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 active in this disease, could it be that keratoconus is just another inflammatory disease? Um, yeah. And then we'll use uh, his to, to, to eye drops to treat it. <laughs> I, I don't think eye drops will... So the, the, the underlying effect, yes, it may be uh, uh, like, like you say, but um, I don't think the treatments, if we were directed on there, would be enough because the diagnosis of keratoconus is, well, we're, we're getting there, it's becoming better, but it's in relatively late stage. You need to have structural deformation before you'll even know how to, to, to treat it, to diagnose it. And, and one of the theories is that if you have a thinning part of the cornea, uh, stress strain distribution is, is changing. So the, the thinning part may get a bit stiffer, but another part it will thin. Thus, the progression uh, continues as it's a vicious circle. I don't think inhibiting this process of, of inflammatory responses would be enough to, to completely stop the progression because you still have the, the vicious circle going on there. So we're talking uh, the chicken who does a bow have a Bowman's membrane or the egg, right? And um, but, but I'm not talking actually about the, 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 the clinical diagnosis as we do it now, but do you think that we could find one day uh, some inflammatory markers that actually may uh, help us in the diagnosis? So it won't only be a topographical or, or deformation of the cornea diagnosis, but that we can also have some lab tests yes. adding uh, up to this and that we then can, you know, point out the targeted patients, do personalized medicine on them. That, that would be the best to have. And I think there, there's some research going on with Roy Chetty that's actually developing uh, uh, based on tear uh, samples. So yes, mm -hmm. I, I think that's, it's heading that direction. It, it's outside of the scope of the thesis, so I'm, I'm not fully uh, feeling confident on saying something smart about it. But um, I do think it will go in that direction. But I think more into, uh, in regards to the diagnosis rather than the treatment for, for now at least maybe in, given another 10 years, but uh, mainly in finding the, the right markers to diagnose a patient. I think that's pretty close. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm very satisfied with your answers, and uh, I would like to give the word back to the rector. Um, thank you, Dr. Lapid, for your opposition. And uh, we will now continue with uh, Dr. Visser, who is a corneal surgeon at Maastricht University Medical Center. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate you, Jurian, and also your um, study team with this uh, excellent thesis. I think especially the combination between the clinical research that you did and the biomechanical research is very, um, yeah, it's very well done. Um, I have a question uh, about chapter 2, table 3. Uh, it's on page 44. Uh, and this is about the uh, demarcation line depth. Um, after one month and three months. Um, so my first question is, um, what is the biomechanical background of the demarcation line and the clinical relevance? Uh, esteemed opponent, thank you very much. So the demarcation line, um, like you will know, it's, it's based on OCT imaging. Uh, we've seen after a few, a few weeks after cross-linking. Um, which has been long thought to be the, the difference between treated part and untreated part. There also are some reports that, that don't correlate that, that direct with the demarcation line itself. Um, we don't know from biomechanical testing that the anterior stroma uh, is it, much stiffer than the, the posterior part. So the, the, the first half of the cornea results in about twice the mechanical strength, of, accounts for twice the mechanical strength for the entire cornea in relation to the posterior part. Um, I'm not aware of any clear results uh, linking the demarcation line to the mechanical effect. If that's the question, I understand correctly, right? Mm -hmm. 
Do you think it's uh, what is the relationship with the uh, uh, apoptosis of, of uh, character sites? Uh, does it d directly relate to the depth of the demarcation line? Uh, also, from what I know, we, we didn't test it. Uh, would have been nice to have an OCT with the different chapters, but uh, we didn't test it ourselves. Um, as far as I'm aware, but I'm not 100 percent sure, there's no straight correlation between the demarcation line and the apoptosis of the keratocytes. Okay. Um, some people say for the demarcation line, the deeper the better, it would have more treatment effects. Do you uh, believe this is true? I really think that differs on the uh, on the patient itself. So if you um, have a, let's say, standard patient with 420 micrometers thick cornea, then it may be. But um, there's a report from Gafetzi that did uh, the, the sub-400 protocol, so treating thinner corneas. Um, and they described that if you have, a, I, th I think they, they treated the cornea with 250 micrometers or something like that. Uh, safely, luckily, in the end, but they do report that the demarcation line then doesn't mean it that much anymore. So, um, yes, if you have a standard patient with, with relatively normal, uh, not too thin corneas, then the demarcation line may say something. But if you go thinner than that, I don't know if the value is that high. Okay. Um, when well, you have a look at table three, uh, the demarcation line at one month was about 219, uh, 90 microns, sorry. Whereas at three months, it's a bit shallower, a bit more superficial. It's at about 200 microns. How do you explain this? Uh, so I think the first question is, what's the demarcation line itself? Uh, I think it's the uh, it's a result of the, the treatment itself. So it's there, uh, well, keratocyte apoptosis, but also regeneration, repopulation afterwards uh, happening. That will not be completely done after three months. But I think that's the explanation why at some point the demarcation line will um, um, be a bit lower, like a bit, uh, uh, bit higher. So that's uh, the difference between 290 and 200. Um, and eventually, I think it will fade at some point. Does that answer your question? Because I'm yeah, yeah, okay, sure. Thank um, I was also wondering, did you have a look at the demarcation line depth in um, gr groups of eyes that either receive the uh, hyperosmolar uh, riboflavin or the hypoosmolar riboflavin? So the thinner corn, the, the normal, the above four, 400 uh, corneas and the sub 400 corneas. Yeah, so um, I, I didn't look at it specifically. Also, I think it's, um, you would need a really good uh, RCT to do that because in many cases, if you have uh, during the impregnation time, you will start with the, the hyperosmolar riboflavin and at some point you'll measure the cornea to be too thin and you'll start the, 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 the swelling effect. So. Um, I think in most clinical cases, but again, I don't uh, perform the cross-thinking myself, but I think in most clinical cases, you will end up with a combination of both, so. Um, I have another question regarding uh, chapter two. You mentioned that um, treatment failure occurs, uh, occurred in about 9% of uh, eyes that you treated. Um, in the clinic, this, um, is usually associated uh, with higher or steeper K values, um, and so steeper corneas. However, when you do your uh, linear mixed model analysis, you found that um, higher uh, K values uh, resulted in a uh, higher uh, decrease in um, yeah uh, in the K values. Yeah. So this seems a bit controversial. How do you explain this? Um, I don't think it's controversial because um, if you have a, a higher stupid cornea, uh, the flattening effect is, is, is more. So that's what we found in our linear model. Um, but of course, it's also the most progressed patient you'll have, uh, most likely. So the treatment effect doesn't, uh, uh, the fact that there's a the higher treatment effect does not say anything about the treatment failure in the end, I think. Mm -hmm. So we, we had a time point at one year where we uh, established if there was a treatment failure or not, but yeah, of course, you may see it before or after that also. Do you think there's like a, a value uh, of uh, K values above which patients have a higher uh, risk of a treatment failure? Um, I don't know a value, if cut of value by heart, but um, yes, of course, if, if the K values are higher, like I said, the most likely the patients are more progressed. I do think that uh, K values in themselves are a little bit outdated to say, uh, more like the balance score, for example, would be better to use.
Jurian Bregomons, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defence. I request you and your company to await the results of our deliberation on return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Take the mileage,
Jurian Brekelmans. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and uh, your defense, and in view of its positive verdict, and taking into account the previous qualifications, um, uh, sorry, uh, the, the degree committee has decided to grant you the doctor degree. And Professor Nuitz is authorized to confer up you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch custom, custom and um, I invite your supervisor to take the floor. Belooft u dat u altijd voor ons de beginselen van wetenschappelijke integriteit te werk zult gaan? Eerlijk en zorgvuldig, transparant, onafhankelijk en verantwoordelijk. Dat beloof ik. Krachtens de bevoegdheid ons door de wet toegekend voor ons besluit van de commissie hier tegenwoordig, verklaar ik hierbij u, Juriaan Brekelmans, tot dokter te bevorderen en u alle rechten te verlenen die daaraan voor ons wet en de gewoonte zijn verbonden. Ten bewijze hiervan overhandig ik u nu de bul door rector, secretaris en overige leden van de promotiecommissie ondertekend en met het grootzegel van de universiteit bevestigd. And it's a great pleasure now for us uh, as the uh, promoters and the co-promoters of uh, Urian to give the word to Professor Avigdor Schatz from the Weizmann Institute in Jerusalem, who is going to give the laudatio to Urian. So, Avigdor. Yeah, I, I don't think that I need a microphone. Uh, <laughs> if you don't hear me well, just announce it. So, Urian, first of all, thank you very much, thank my dear. Thank you very much. These were <laughs> fantastic three years uh, to spend with Julian. Uh, the guy, uh, as you can see, is not a show off. He came pretty modest to Israel, and it was pretty quick that he fell in love with Israel, and Israel fell in love with him, and I'm not going to the particulars. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Julian found a way, not only for the, uh, doing a very good science, but eating a very good falafel. Uh, and all other kind of things. Um, everybody in the lab um, that was a little bit peculiar uh, to meet Julian, from the Netherlands, different habits, he got pretty fast the idea of being a little bit aggressive in Israel in order to get what you need. And he practiced it very well during <laughs> the three years. He became uh, pretty fast quick in organizing a very strange flights to Netherlands and back in order to bring some materials, or to uh, Radcliffe, or to other places in the world. This was with no problem. I mean, in and out, just for the science, for the very good science. As for the uh, personal life, I think he fell in love with Tel Aviv a little bit, right? I mean, uh, you can tell. And it was not a great surprise, or was it a great surprise? I don't know uh, that we had his successor in our lab, Demi, all of a sudden meeting her near my uh, new apartment in Tel Aviv, asking her, what are you doing there? And she asked me, what are you doing there? I said, well, I just moved from Rehobot here. And what are, well, I'm just enjoying my uh, off time before I'm going to Australia to continue with the collaboration. So I had an experience with the uh, uh, science in uh, the Netherlands. I was actually personally offered the uh, postdoc position in Leiden, which I had to take over because of uh, some uh, higher temptation in uh, leading uh, laboratories in the United States in Pico and Femto Spectroscopy. And also my wife, who is in science teaching, Professor at the Weizmann, and so we moved. But since then, I really wanted something like that to be in the lab. And I'm happy to say that it was an extremely good promotion for the continuation of the collaboration with the uh, Netherlander, with here, with Maastricht, with uh, um, the whole team that stands here, and the translation of basic science into practicality. And I wish Julian that in the coming years we'll see you back, <laughs> both in the research and in the, practic uh, in the practice, because 
what we try very hard to do with Aria, your promoter, who was my PhD student, and with you, is to get some real things, some really problems that will help your career and make the milestone in your career. So don't leave it behind. Just continue to do whatever you can. And you are mostly welcome in Israel. You know it. For months, the turn out to be a year. Yeah. Three months in the beginning, the turn out to be three years. For months, for a year, for whatever. We are very proud and we love you, Yuriam. Thank you very much. It was Thanks. really a pleasure, my dear. Very nice. Thank you. Dear Dr. Brekermans, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I want to give you the congratulations uh, with the academic degree that you just have uh, acquired. Um, I think it was a very uh, convincing uh, defense that you did, and the committee was unanimously of that opinion. Uh, so after all these years of hard work that brought us to this point, it's time to celebrate. Uh, so there will be a reception. The reception is in the Refter. If you follow us, then you will find it where it is, if you don't know that. Um, we will leave the, uh, the Ola first and go to the stairs to make a picture. And then afterwards, we will uh, reconvene in the refter at the reception. And thereby, I close this academic session.